Can you do me a favor? Can you go get that stool that uh, Corey normally sits on, please? <coughs> Miracles. Miraculous moments. Those signs we see in everyday life that, that point to divine intervention. Miracles certainly happen in the Old Testament. Would everybody agree with that? Every, you know, miracles are, are certainly something, and we do, thank you so much, that we can uh, always certainly agree with. What are some of the miracles that we experience in the Old Testament? Parting of the sea, the creation of earth. What are some other ones that you, you remember? Manna from heaven. That's, that's a huge one right there. So what else? I, I, think, I, I, I think about the look on Ahab's face as he saw his little altar being burned to incineration, burned to, to absolutely obliteration, because Elijah said, Lord, show off. Boom! And, and his little stone altar was incinerated. I, I can imagine Ahab's face going, Yo, go ahead and p- pick up that cheek there, buddy, because, yeah, you just saw it. You saw my God in action. And that's huge. That's huge. So... What about Daniel in the lion's den? Was that pretty cool? And, and also, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, why do I like that? Because I like the way their names sound. You know, and, and, but that's a, such a wonderful story about them going into that furnace. And wow, what a, what a miracle that was. Well, did the miracle stop at the Old Testament? No. No, certainly not. They got different. Now we're talking about a virgin birth. And we're talking about the, the miracle feeding of thousands through such a little, by blessing, by healing the blind and healing the lame. Please heal. And, and those that cannot walk and talk and raising the dead. Wasn't that huge? That's huge. Your friend Lazarus, all of a sudden, he's all wrapped up and stinky, and now all of a sudden he comes out. Can you imagine the look on our face if something like that happened? Wow. But that was then. Those were the, the miracles of the Old and New Testament, right? That did not happen anymore, right? Oh, that's right, you're catching on. We, we disagree with that. We disagree with that. Why? Because miracles do happen today. Amen? I... I am a walking, talking miracle. I, I will tell you that. Some of you guys know I have had five near-death episodes in my life. Five. And I, I look at that situation where, you know, a near-drowning, a car accident, a severe infection, skateboarding head injury, and yes, even a plane wreck. And yet all those were trumped by the grace and the glory that God gives, gives me. And I know that. I know that. I know that Leslie and I have brought three miracles into, into existence. We know that. And why is that? Because Leslie, many years ago, the doctor said, you can't have kids. You can't have kids. Well, I, I look at one of my, my walking, talking miracles right now, and that's Aaron, and the other two are Kai and Paige. And that's beautiful. That's beautiful. And what about Paige? That's huge. That's a miracle. Those are things that we can look at. I, I look at the, the other situations of, of how many stories that we have, not only within our own congregation, but without the world. Those, those rescuing folks from such bizarre situations. How about that tugboat cook? Do y'all remember that one? Where the, the boat hit a, a barge, sank almost immediately, 90 feet in water. And somehow or another, he got caught in a pocket of water for three days. Ninety feet of water, people. He was in this pocket of water. The rest of his crewmen died. So they sent some divers down there to go salvage the boat. 
and go recover the bodies. They were never expecting somebody to be down there. Can you imagine the, the shock on one of those divers' face? Hi! I'm glad you're here! Wow! You know, there was another one. There were a couple snowmobilers that were out, and they were snowmobiling, and they saw this car that was buried in snow. And they went over just to kind of investigate, because you get curious. And so they scrape the snow off, and they find a body in there. And they're, they're expecting it's going to be a dead body, because this is, this is cold weather. And he moves. And guess how long he's been in there? Not one month, but two months. Sixty days he was in there. No food. No food. He, had, he was just eating the, the, the water, the ice, and that was it. How did these things happen? I know what the word is. What is it? God. Miracles. The, these times. Yes, miracles do happen. They happen every single day. I'm looking at one right now. You know, it, it's, it's beautiful. We, we see these, these situations that happen time and time and time again. To, and why, why do we have these miracles? We, we see these miracles that are reinforcement for those who doubt. We see these miracles for those who hope. And those that get the privilege, the privilege to witness the glory and grace of our loving God. This week's passage starts out with signs. And it even ends up with a few signs that we need to pay attention to because these signs are there for us. Each of them are for us. I believe that in the third week of the Advent, this week of joy, we look to the messenger of the message. We look to John the baptizer, the prepare ye the way John. That John is who we're looking at. John was one of two kids, two kids, who were brought into this world with a, an angelic greeting card. Right? Now, you know, we, we get these little Hallmark cards, and we go, oh, you know, here's our birth announcement, and God sends angels for his birth announcements. That's pretty impressive to me. But John, Jesus' second cousin, remember, these, these guys are related. This is, these guys are family. They were set, he was set apart for special service for God. It says Luke in 141, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leapt from her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. It was in the divine works that John would be the messenger to the message. What is the message? Jesus Christ. He goes out in the wilderness and he starts proclaiming the arrival of the Messiah. He also starts baptizing folks as well. And this is in John's life, this is the apex of his ministry. This is the height of his ministry. And he comes in favor of, of baptizing God. That, that, that's really the top of his, his game. He baptizes God. Wow. Wow. To, to even be there when Jesus is walking down and John humbles, humbles himself to Christ, saying, I can't even touch your sandals. I can't even touch your sandals let alone baptize you. And Jesus replies to him, no, cousin, you're going to do this. You have to do this. It's part of the plan. And so he does, and what happens? A dove comes down. God comes down and says, this is my son. I think he talks like that. I don't know. Maybe he talks. This is my son with whom I am well pleased. Wow. Can you imagine hearing that? Uh, just the, the, the deafening whisper or roar or however it came out of God talking, of the dove descending, of Christ being baptized. What a, a beautiful image that is of the three in one being separate yet united. As I said, this is really the, the apex of John's ministry. The messenger introduced the message. Following that, John accused Herod of flagrant sin violations when Herod opted to marry his sister-in-law. Ick. So, what does this evil, mean ruler to do when he's accused of wrongdoing, but to do what? 
Well, to shut this disquieting presence up and put them in jail. That's what you do. Now, this doesn't stop the human being from being human. My initial feelings when I'm, I'm seeing this is that John was really starting to doubt things. When you read this going, well, John's asking, like, why, what am I doing here? You know, am I done? And from the pinnacle of his career to, to ministry in the prison, he was, it was a really steep, downhill, suck-in-your-stomach roller coaster ride. Whoa! Wow, that was not fun. Now he's in prison. And I thought, you know, you, you, you almost picture John, and if I could do it, whatever, he'd be sitting on one of those dirt floors. And he'd be thanking, he'd praying, I know that my cousin's it. I know that. I know that Jesus was the message. You told me that he was the Messiah. But why am I here? Why? You can you almost feel that, that, that talk that you would have. Because sometimes that's what we pray. We pray almost frustrated sometimes when things are just not going the way we envisioned them. And, you know, here, here's your messenger, God, sitting on this dirt floor. Johnny's luck has run out. A chump and change. So John sends a couple of his disciples, his disciple, my emphasis, to talk to Jesus. And Jesus says in 11, verse 4, Go and tell John what you hear and see. What you hear and see. The blind see, the lame walk. And on and on and on. Something's still not ringing quite right about this, this, this message, this, this story, this scripture. All of my studies never pointed to John the Baptist or being John the Doubter. None of them. Doesn't even exist, but... Something, something, something's different with this. Even in this dire time of his existence, of his life, I could never really wrap my mind around and point that John doubted that Christ was it. So I figured I was not the first person who, who encountered this question, who thought of this question. So I look at my old friend Martin Luther. Now Martin Luther goes way back there, right? The old friar back then. I like seeing what some of the older theologians uh, uh, thought of particular issues or verse or scriptures. And we have an entire uh, book series that John Fridge had given us of Martin Luther's sermons. So if you're ever interested in seeing what Martin Luther had to say, we had that. So I opened the, one of the books up. And he actually preached on the same thing, Third Advent, the Joy Season, about this scripture because it's a lectionary cycle. And he did it back in 1520, almost 500 years ago, when he pinned this par uh, parchment out. And Luther stated early on in his three hour long sermon, do y'all want me to read it for you? No? Are, are you sure? I mean, I, I can. No, I want to live. It's okay. Well, here's the part that really matters today. This is what Martin Luther said so many years ago. It says, Hence, it is evident, John knew very well that Jesus was he that should come. For he had baptized him and testified that Christ was the Lamb of God. So it was clear to Martin that John knew that Jesus was the one. The one. So what is going on here? Again, it was that the wording of the passage that gave way for that deeper look. His disciples. His disciples. Who's Jesus' disciples? No. No. And that's the key. That's the key. It doesn't say that. It says his disciples. Since when does John need students to learn about John? Disciples of me, please, take away that adorning look, those worshipful eyes on me. I'm not the one. You can hear John saying that to his, to his disciples. I'm not the one. I am the messenger. Go see Jesus. Go talk to him. Go ask him yourself. John, once again, from the depths of the dungeon, from that dirt floor, is doing what? He's delivering the message. 
Martin Luther states further, but when Jesus began to perform miracles and became famous, then John thought he would point his disciples away from himself and lead them to Christ in order that they might not think of the establishment, excuse me, his disciples away from himself and lead them to Christ in order that they may not, might not think of establishing a new sect and becoming Johnites. That was Martin Luther's word of Johnites. But that all might cling to Christ and become Christians. John sends them to Christ so that from now on they might learn not only from the witness he bore of Christ, but also from the words and deeds of Christ himself, that he was the one in whom John had spoken. Now Luther continues just a little bit more. I'm not going to read the whole 10,000 words of it. Put away the gross worldly deception that he, Jesus, would ride on steeds in armor. He, Jesus, is increasing, but I, John, must now decrease. My work must cease, but his must continue. You must leave me and cling to him. To my disciples, to my students who look at me, John the baptizer, for a sign, well, here's your sign. Here's your sign. I am the messenger. You need to go up to the road a bit and talk to the message. Talk to Christ. He will explain what you need to, uh, to see. Now, this was not the first time or the last time that folks look elsewhere for answers to questions in their lives, is it? No, this happens in old times. This happens in these times. This happens in future times. There's always somebody out there looking for a sign, looking for something, grasping onto something that may get, uh, tell them some type of a future telling that they're looking for. A few good things start happening positively for a pastor or a preacher or a prophet, and those who have been blessed to be a part of that message may begin to think that they are the message, as well as those that are blessed by the experience. They start losing focus. It's like you take your glasses off. I've shared with you before about how blind I am. I can't see any of you right now because I've lost focus. I can't see without these. We can't see without Christ. They start losing that focus. They start questioning on what is and what is not. And there are times in our lives that we are misguided, misled. We misinterpret about what something means. And don't get stuck in that rut that you think that this is it. This is the sign that I've been looking for. That will answer my prayers, heed my call, and get me back on track again. You want a sign? You want a sign? Here is your sign, right here. Genesis to Revelation, here is your sign. If you sometimes doubt your salvation, the forgiveness of your sins, or God's work in your life, look at the evidence in the scriptures and the changes in your life. And when you doubt, don't turn away from Christ. Turn to him, just like Leslie was saying. Turn to him. John, the exciting Nazarite. Messenger, camel-haired tunic. Can you imagine wearing one of those things? No. <laughs> Wild wilderness man. Baptizing God. Prison-filled roller coaster life was cut short by the trickery of Herod's ex-wife. And you know the story. What do you want? You can have anything you want. I want John's head. Well, that was mean. That was not nice. But again, she was scorned. She was slighted. She was outed by John. So she didn't like that situation. Didn't like that the messenger was actually giving the message of truth. Yet even in death, his message rings true. As an example of not being the light, but rather reflecting the light of Christ. Well, after Jesus talks to the two students of John, he turns to the crowd and asks them, what did you go out into the wilderness to look at? A reed shaken by the wind? Soft-robed person? A prophet? Well, congratulations, you found John. Yay. But do you see what I see? Do you see?
see what I see. Have you found what you were looking for? John found what he was looking for on that day when Christ walked down from the Jordan. Walked down off that hill. He found what he was looking for. The one whose sandals he felt he could not carry. Look, the Lamb of God who took, takes away the sins of the world. Yes, he found what he was looking for. and continues to point to others to the way that they were looking for. And even to this day, there are priests and pastors and preachers. Oh my! All of them, they are trying to reflect the light, or at least they should be trying to reflect the light. His glory, His way. They are all trying to encourage others, just like us, to see what they see. Not only the miracles that point to the message, but to see the light that is the message. As we know, miracles do indeed happen every single day of our lives. As they did happen yesterday, as they happened in the New and Old Testament, signs and sights that are, allow our human self to, to almost realign ourselves with divine intervention that surrounds our existence. Yet the greatest miracle the greatest miracle that each of us as professing Christians will ever encounter is believing in the message. Not the messenger. The message. Do you see what I see? Joy to the world and forevermore. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.